There has been something interesting quietly going on at Square Enix recently. Between releasing three Voice of Cards games, all in the same fiscal year, all of which I've covered on this channel by the way, and gearing up for larger games like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Forspoken, Square Enix has been keeping their lineup fairly stacked with remakes and more than just a few titles in that special B-game realm. Seriously, Triangle Strategy, a remake of Tactics Ogre, a brand new Star Ocean game, The Dio Field Chronicle, a remake of Live, Live, the Live, 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 Alive, Live, Alive, and now even a new entry in the dormant Valkyrie Profile series, all within just a few months. And while aggregate sites have been showing that most of these games have been kind of, well, mid, I have found this recent explosion to be a very welcome change of pace for the publisher. For me, I am reminded of the similar wave of experimental and low-budget RPGs that came out of Square Enix towards both the end of the PS2 and PS3 lifespans. These were times that brought us games like Grandia 3, Radiata Stories, and my favorite game of all time, Drakengard 3. So this recent slew of games has got me excited for the RPG and action RPG genre, even if it is doubtful that any of these new titles will be considered classics in years to come. So, with my interest fully peaked, and with the Voice of Cards trilogy making me more than optimistic about the publisher right now, I decided to pick up one of these new releases with Valkyrie Elysium. I have never played a game in this series before, so this is not a video coming from someone who is a fan of the franchise. Instead, I picked this game up specifically because it reminded me of another game that had an impact on me. A female protagonist wearing mostly white, a party of four disciples, running between corridors and enemy arenas, Square Enix publishing it, all of these things felt familiar and I just had a small hope that this game would somehow end up being this generation's Drakengard 3. And uh, I'll get it out of the way quickly, uh, no, that this game is no Drakengard 3, it's almost nothing like it. While there are some surface level similarities and the mission structure is very similar, this game plays itself straight in its storytelling and progression. So. No insane breakings of the fourth wall or last minute rhythm game themed bosses this time around, I'm afraid. Although it should be stated that this game's performance is light years ahead of the slideshow frame rate that D3 could be sometime. So what is Elysium? For starters, this is a standalone title in the franchise, with this game presenting itself as a all new tale. So you don't have to have played any of the previous games. And the title has you taking on the role of an unnamed Valkyrie tasked by Odin, the Allfather, in purifying the land of Midgar in order to stave off the impending end of everything with the cataclysm known as Ragnarok. It's all pretty bog standard stuff, especially if you're familiar with Norse mythology. And just as standard, your mission to purify the realm is also fairly unremarkable. You do it because Odin has told you it is the only way to combat Fenrir, the wolf beast that serves as this game's real threat. And while Odin definitely presents himself as an all-powerful being thanks to some really decent voice acting by Michael Schaefer and his amazing design with gold flecks denoting an entry he sustained before the events of the story, his posture, and just the truly swagged out leather suit. And I'm buying of shit with your royalty checks, and I'm swallowed. The actual task he hands out to Valkyrie decidedly lacks some of his flair for the dramatic. Elysium uses a mission select structure where you choose your mission or side mission and then you run down linear corridors, sometimes veering off to the side to find an odd collectible or new bit of equipment, but typically you are running directly down hallways towards a waypoint until the hallway opens up into a room just big enough to where you know, yeah, there's gonna be a fight here. And that is where the meat of this game is found, in its combat. It starts off simple enough, you have attack strings that can be punctuated with a triangle press for a finisher, you can block and dodge, you have a soul chain that allows you to close the distance rapidly, think something like Devil May Cry 4. And you have arts that allow for you to blast enemies with magic, starting with something just as simple as a chain lightning attack. And this combat is serviceable enough in the beginning, albeit a little bland, but it does eventually evolve to include a pretty decent amount of options. And that is where my main complaint of this game comes from, in that it makes a terrible first impression. Everything about the game from the beginning is fairly bland and underwhelming. First, this game is not a looker by any stretch of the imagination, and choosing to place the tutorial in this flower field is one of the worst decisions ever, as it features some of the worst anti-aliasing I've ever seen, almost to the level where it's just pixel vomit. The default camera settings are rough, and it causes a lot of confusion and disorientation. 
the combat is, like I said earlier, just nothing notable at first, and it does take a just really long time to become fully fleshed out. I would say around three-fourths of the game before you really see everything. The opening environments are incredibly generic, even though they do feature one of the strangest skyboxes I've ever seen. Uh, om almost to a point where I kind of respect it, because it's so strange. And the cutscenes are just lifeless. I am a Valkyrie. Odin has commanded me to purify the souls of the undead. And that is probably the best adjective I can use to describe the majority of the setup here. It's lifeless. Whenever characters are talking to each other in cutscenes, they come across as just wooden. It really reminded me of being a child and standing my action figures across from each other and taking turns just doling out whatever dialogue my adolescent brain could muster. And what makes matters worse is that this game does open up and make some choices later on that lets you kind of know that a lot of this lifelessness that was there early on in the first few levels was in some cases a design choice. Our main character in Elysium is a Valkyrie, and in this game's interpretation that means that she is essentially a soulless vessel designed by Odin to carry out his bidding. Young lady. But as the plot progresses and Valkyrie meets and eventually befriends her disciples, and this game in Harrier, which were souls of warriors that were unable to pass on to the afterlife and instead they pledge their fealty to Valkyrie, she eventually begins to show signs of emotion and eventually humanity. And so this character that in the early hours of the game just came across like a mannequin does begin to show signs of life, in no small part because of some decent facial animations and the clever design choice of giving her expressive big green eyes. And it is in these moments and design choices that you can see that there are some real moments of inspiration, but a lot of them just come across as flashes. Flashes like Taika's design that is something between a human and something more monstrous, but in order to really get the full impact of this design and understand how it affects her characterization, you not only have to do all of her side missions, but you have to stand by and listen to her backstory told in the form of an audio drama that is referred to as her memories. You won't need chains in there. Put your arms out. I'll take them off. No, leave them on. Please. I... I don't know how long I can hold this power back. All the in Harrier have these little audio logs to flesh out their exposition, but they are doled out over time and tucked away in menus, and because they are not integrated into the plot, they serve as little more than companion pieces and lack the full effect that they could have otherwise had. It's a shame too, because between these tragic stories and between what development there is between Odin, Valkyrie, and the supporting cast, and even Fenrir, there are scenes and moments where you can see the outline of a vastly more interesting story. But it takes a while to get to these scenes, so for hours I thought that the husk of a character that I was playing as was as deep as things were going to get, and the eventual development of Valkyrie into something that resembles human was severely undercut by the fact that the writers and director just didn't trust themselves to simply show and not tell, as all the inheritor make sure to take more than just a few occasions to point out this change in her to one another. It's not like you to show so much interest in a human. Did it seem that way to you? It is nothing. You've been pretty quiet for a while now. What's up? I was thinking about humans. And they keep this up until you are just beaten over the head with this. Have you noticed how she's nicer now? Have you noticed that she's not a robot? Valkyrie's really changed, hasn't she? This isn't the most subtle writing. And this clumsy writing shows up everywhere in the game. Fairly early on, you are introduced to an antagonist named Hilde. You know that she's the antagonist because, well, She's an all black, you see, and you're the good guy because you're in all what? Okay. But after the battle, she calls you out for being a puppet. And fair enough, I mean, you've only come across as one at this point. And by comparison, she comes across as passionate, feisty, and ready to fight. And she tells you that you are a fool for serving Odin. Right away, anyone with half a brain could see the eventual plot twist coming. I won't go into detail about it, but playing as a servant to an all-powerful god that might have their own motive? Yeah, yeah, no shit, you don't say. But what I will say is that this game takes far too long for Valkyrie to come to terms with what this woman had told her. And she more or less needs to collect primers on the world that more or less explain the secrets of the entire universe before she gets it. I... I can hardly believe it. So this was the truth all along. She's a bit on the thick side, I guess. And then there is this whole other arc with a character named Armand, a human searching far and wide in an almost dead world for his lost love. And I 
guess if you don't see this plot twist coming, I, I have nothing for you. All of this is exacerbated by the fact that this game just plays itself completely straight. Even down to Valkyrie's quips in battle that are so generic that I actually laughed out loud the first few time I heard some of them. <laughs> I do not see the humor in this. There is a self-seriousness here that just sucks the fun out of the game. I stated earlier that I had unfairly compared this game to Drakengard 3 at first, or at least I hoped it would be something similar. And while Drakengard 3 was a technical shit show, the way that it endeared itself to the audience was by seldom taking itself seriously from the beginning, by being over the top and then slowly introducing the player to the full force of the game's deeper themes. It knew at its core that it was a bad game. It knew that all it had was some generic combat, pretty cool cutscenes, and writing to offer. But the difference is that that game capitalized on those things to a great effect. There's one more thing I need to tell you. What? You've grown strong, Mikhail. <laughs> but Elysium, this game just really struggles to find its own identity a lot of the time. The plot is super generic. You have your prime evil, you have your prime good, and it turns out that neither of them are exactly that binary. In fact, they both have areas of grey to them, and you flesh this out as you go around killing monsters, and you make some buddies. There really isn't that much more depth than that. And this is something that not even this game's four endings can really remedy. There are some little moments that are punctuated by Valkyrie's awakening into something that resembles human that work, and Really, that is all that this game has to offer from a storytelling standpoint. This slow realization and development of our protagonist. And it's a little frustrating because equally slow is how this game goes about developing its gameplay. If Elysium has one thing really holding itself back, it is this desire to be considered an action RPG instead of just an action game. Because every little bit of progression to the combat system is either locked behind collectible currency, plot progression, or locked behind side quests. Unlockable skills and weapon upgrades all require gems, most of which are obtained in combat, but the game does this annoying thing where the gems are tied to certain milestones in the plot progression. So for instance, if a skill that you want requires something like a rainbow gem, you have to make it far enough into the game where the enemies will drop them. So you are often given this dilemma of choosing to take on side quests that could give you access to more abilities, but with your current loadout that you cannot upgrade until the next plot beat, it means that the fights are going to be a little bit more grindy than they would otherwise need to be, unless you want to go back overpowered to go get them. And it sucks because it undermines what would otherwise be a fairly fun battle system. When you strip this game down to its fundamental core, Valkyrie Elysium is a game about exploiting enemy weaknesses and dealing as much damage as possible while practicing crowd control, with the occasional battle extending between the player and the camera, because it can get pretty jank from time to time. Each enemy in the game has a weakness, and luckily you never really have to do any type of searching or memorization to figure out what they're weak to, as it is always plastered directly on top of their health bar. Enemies have two sections of their health bar, one that denotes how much damage you have to do to kill them, and the other side that shows their elemental weakness. Hit an enemy with enough of the correct element, and they will go into a stagger state where they're considered crushed, and then most enemies can be dogpiled onto further to lock them into an immobilized state for extra damage. Achieving this state can be done with three different techniques. Using a weapon with the affinity that they are weak to, calling upon one of your foreign harrier to blast them with the desired element, or taking matters into your own hands and hitting them with a crushing attack on your own. So combat basically boils down to zipping around the screen like a crazy person and staying airborne as long as possible, all while keeping track of your three resources, HP, art skill points, or MP in any other RPG, and your soul gauge that allows you to summon your party members. And it gets pretty fun considering how fast the game is and how you're always on your toes with your resources, and the mid to late game usually does a good job of mixing up the enemy composition so that you are always summoning two or three of your inheritor back to back to really DPS down whichever enemy is likely to cause you the most threat at any given moment. It all kind of works. There is even some pretty decent depth here. Dodging at the right moment causes the game to slow down for a second as Valkyrie sprouts wings from her back, giving her some extra follow-up options. Uh, think which time from Bayonetta. You can parry, you can also set up auto summons for your party whenever certain conditions are met, and your art skills offer up frames of invincibility, which I always abused whenever an enemy telegraphed that they were about to unleash an unblockable attack, canceling it out. 
It's good shit. Elysium never really reaches Devil May Cry or Bayonetta fluidity, as this game doesn't allow for much animation cancelling outside of hitting triangle to end combo strings early, and I guess you have a little bit of cancellation as the arts have priority and that aforementioned iframes, but this is not a game where you can roll cancel or you can guard cancel. And as a result, it can come across as slightly clunky, maybe similar to something like Persona 5 Strikers, but it is even less refined than that. Maybe a better comparison would be No More Heroes 3, as I think this game edges that one out. If there was one thing that I would change, even though I have an armchair designed a better solution for it in combat, it is how the arts are mapped to the controller. To use them, you push R2 to bring up a quick menu, and then you use a mapped face button to unleash the attack. But similar to how some Pokemon can develop 4-move syndrome in their game, you can't always have every weakness mapped to your menu in combat. So this means that you will often find yourself pausing in the action so that you can go into the menus and quickly reassign a skill for you to use in that skirmish, and then flipping it around for the next one. I would like to see this system reworked if there were to be a substantial update or sequel to this game. But to be fair, Square Enix really hasn't done a game like this before outside of Guard 3, and the combat here is clearly better than that game. And so, in that regard, I do consider the combat in this game to be somewhat of a success story, even if it is just on a minor league kind of level. And it really is just a minor success, because that is really as deep as the gameplay gets here. Because outside of combat, there really just isn't much to this game. Exploration, if you can call it that, really just entails seeing which direction the waypoints are steering you in, and taking a slight detour before emptying a chest or picking a flower for some flavor text at the end of the road. And then this game features puzzles as the tutorials call them, but all they boil down to is finding a barrier on the field and calling upon the corresponding party member to take care of it. And all this kind of blends together because there really isn't much here in the way of environmental diversity. There are some levels in particular that slightly stand out, like the Grecian-inspired level with its canals and nice art direction, an ascent up some snow-covered mountains, and the gaudy halls of Valhalla that call the far more visually striking game El Shaddai to mind. In no small part because you can find Odin slumped in his throne at the far end of it, kind of similar to some of the characters in that game. But even these standouts outstay their welcome, doubly so if you partake in the side quest, as you will see all of these environments far too often for them to maintain their novelty. And the rest is just really generic castles, forests, halls with pillars. The game often has trouble deciding if it's going for a gothic theme or if it's going for high fantasy, but all of it is tropey and rather generic. Overall, Valkyrie Elysium is an experimental game for Square Enix, and in terms of combat, I think they did alright. I did enjoy some scenes in which our protagonist showed some real development, even if some of it wasn't always earned, and there were a few other moments that came across as earnest, and I liked those. The problem is that all that is really going on for this game is ultimately truncated by what is otherwise generic fluff, uninspired or tropey writing and music, and a desire to pad out the game with antiquated RPG systems. If there is a real lesson Square Enix should learn from this game, it is the following. A decent game loop is all well and good, but if you are not expanding upon it in an interesting way, or it is taking far too long to get to its full implementation, then you are going to have to find ways to make that loop interesting by adding some real character or spectacle to make up for what is otherwise generic. I didn't hate this game, even though it may sound that way. I played through the whole thing, I saw all the endings, and I even played through the recently added free DLC that allows you to play as the antagonist Hilde, which actually didn't take that long to unlock all of her combat options, thus making it a far better gameplay experience. Although I would point it out that this DLC added with some bizarre fan service um, that didn't quite make sense to me, I, I don't know why they ended it here. And I even tried my hand at this game's version of DMC's Bloody Palace in the form of the Seraphic Gate, a challenge mode that gives you predetermined loadouts for combat, and I all but platinum this game. And the only reason I didn't is because the difficulty trophies didn't stack, and so while I beat the game on hard, it didn't reward me for beating the game on normal, and I don't know if I'm going back to finish this whole thing again. But all that said, I did find this game mostly engaging in a video game ass video game kind of way. When the game was raising its stakes, I cared, and when I was doing side quests, I did retreat into the podcast thing where I was not really paying attention, but that's okay, sometimes grinding's all right. I basically feel like if this game were cheaper, considerably cheaper, this is a full price game by the way, which is a little gross, 
I would probably recommend it to people who like B-tier action RPGs or just hack and slash gameplay. But more importantly than how the content in this game works or doesn't work, I really liked what this game represents. And that is Square Enix not being afraid to take risks again. Even if it's just with a low budget, they still went back and tried to rework one of their more cult classics. And I respect that. I like calculated risks like this, as my favorite game of all time came out of a risk just like it. I don't want to play games that are the same every year. And even if they are a little generic sometimes like this, at least I didn't feel like I had seen this a million times. So if this game does go down in price to say less than $30, maybe even around that $20 sweet spot, and you see something in this video that fires off in your mind, go get it. Just don't expect it to blow you away. This is a good little game overall, but nothing about it is particularly great. But that's okay. At least for me it is. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you for watching. It's always greatly appreciated. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing as I'm going to continue making videos like this, and I'm still trying to build this channel up. And for engagement, feel free to leave a comment or just a like. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this, and you're all beautiful people.